I have just enough cold to be annoying. <laughs> so I'm going to sit in this chair and take care of myself a little bit. And if you see me giving a little bit of distance, that's why. I don't want to share the love with anybody. Uh, but I'm so glad to be with you today. Um, we are fin continuing our series on majoring in the minors. If you have not already, please open up your St. John app and follow along in our sermon notes. Those are there for you to follow along. Hopefully you're finding those helpful. So we're jumping into Zephaniah today, and I want to kind of catch us up to where we are. So we know that the northern kingdom has gone the Assyrian Empire had taken that over, and now the Assyrian Empire is starting to fall apart and starting to dissemble, which is a good thing. The Babylonians are taking them over, but uh, Judah, the southern kingdom, is hanging on by a very, very, very small thread. Under the reign of some different kings, Ahaz and Hezekiah and the worst of the worst, Manasseh, Judah was on the wrong path. They were worshiping other gods. They were doing more acts of evil than had ever been seen before. And they were not in good shape. When Manasseh passed away, his son Amon took over. And while someone would think, okay, good, maybe his son will be better, that was not the case. Amon was just as bad. So much so that there was a bunch of assassins that came together to get rid of it. They knew that they had to stop the path that Judah was on. So they assassinated uh, Amon. Unfortunately, there were some people, some other Judeans, who didn't feel like that was the right choice. So they found those assailants, those who had killed Amon, and uh, they executed them. And they put on the throne eight-year-old Josiah. Eight years old. I'm 38. Don't put me on a throne. <laughs> but he was eight, and so he gets on the throne, which is where we enter into Zephaniah. Zephaniah was the prophet for Josiah. And uh, he prophesied before Josiah's many reforms. If you don't know Josiah, he was actually one of the good kings. He did a lot of good things for Judah. He tried to um, get them back to worshiping only God. They started taking over some of the different countries that had taken them over, trying to implement worshiping God again. And so he did a lot of great reforms, and he did a lot of great things. And a big reason for that was because of Zephaniah's prophecy. So we don't know much about Zephaniah, as with many minor prophets, but we do know a couple things. We know that Zephaniah's name means the Lord hides. And his parents probably named him that because he was born during the reign of Manasseh. And Manasseh liked to kill infants and sacrifice them. So he did not, the parents probably named him Zephaniah because they didn't want uh, Manasseh to find him. As a matter of fact, Manasseh had sacrificed his own son to the Ammonite god Melech at one point. We also know we have a really cool genealogy in the very first verse of Zephaniah. Now this is special, probably a lot of theories point towards because he has royal lineage. That's probably the only reason that we have a lineage for Zephaniah. So it's very, very likely that he and Josiah were distant cousins, which would have helped Zephaniah when he prophesied to have some more influence over Josiah because they did have that family connection. Now, when you read the book of Zephaniah, you'll realize another big reason for why Josiah had these many, many reforms. Stop! Hammer time! Stop! Hammer time. If I would dance, I would do the MC Hammer dance right now. I tried to do this last time whenever we talked about the hammer, but I resisted. I couldn't resist it a second time. I had to bring some MC Hammer in here because Zephaniah definitely brings the hammer. He brings the hammer. And don't worry, I'm not going to go down a really hard path of judgment like I did a couple of weeks ago when we talked about that. But I do want to remind you that it's very important to understand the judgment of God and the love of God. They go hand in hand. You cannot have one without the other. So when we visit the book of Zephaniah, we look at the first chapter. In the first chapter, Zephaniah paints a very apocalyptic picture of the destruction of Judah and Jerusalem. It was not a pretty picture. In verse 2, it says, I will utterly sweep away everything from the face of the earth. It is going to be dissolute. There's going to be nothing left of Judah and Jerusalem. He is going to wipe it clean. This was not a pretty picture that the people of Judah heard from Zephaniah, that Josiah heard from Zephaniah. 
And also, when you read this, because there's only three chapters, and just as every week, we're going to challenge you to read each book. Um, it's only three chapters, so it's really quick to do. You'll notice that there's a creational turn in the poetry of Zephaniah in this first chapter. And the reason is because there is a creational turn in this book because God created creation to be just and to have order. And the people were messing it up. It was supposed to be just and right and holy, and instead it was unjust, evil, and wrong. Now in chapter 2, this is where Zephaniah predicts or prophesies that the countries around Judah will fall as well. And what God is doing here is he's wiping off all these influences that have come into Judah and caused them to worship other gods, to do other things that are not of the one true God. So not only is he wiping out Judah, but he's wiping out all those countries around so that he can be sure that they get a fresh start and they won't have that influence any longer. Now these were the same judgments heard from Nahum and Habakkuk. Judgment and destruction were coming to even God's people. But today we're going to turn to chapter 3 and we're going to read of this song of joy as it's called. So let's jump in. Sing aloud, O daughter Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has turned away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall fear disaster no more. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear, O Zion. Do not let your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a warrior who gives victory. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will renew you in his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. That is quite a turn from the first two chapters. You see, Zephaniah finishes what Nahum started. Destruction, judgment, followed by hope and salvation. Now we know God's character is just. He will always seek justice. He wants to rescue the world, humanity from evil, violence, and the hate that people tend to sway towards one another. He does that through justice, through seeking it, ensuring it, and sometimes wiping away kingdoms and humanity, as we find so often in the Old Testament. He does this because he loves the world that he created, and he wants it to be as he created it, to be loving, peaceful, perfect, and just. Now, judgment and salvation is a recurring theme throughout the Old Testament. And we know where there is repetition, there is importance. I say that a lot, right? Where there is repetition, there is importance. So reading the Old Testament, while it can seem tedious, like how many more times can I read about when people are going to be destroyed, that God is going to wipe off all these people from the face of the planet? How many more times can I read that? But we do. We read it over and over and over again. There are these themes of judgment and redemption, justice and salvation, accountability and freedom. So why the repetition? Why do we need to hear this story over and over and over again? Because, friends, it is our story. It is our story. If we don't read the Old Testament, if we don't dig in and learn about the God of the Old Testament, we will miss a huge, big part of our own stories. We may forget that we too need God's forgiveness over and over and over again. We may forget that we are sinners saved by God's grace. We may forget that we too have our own struggles. We may not fully learn how desperately this world needed and still needs Jesus. How desperately we need Jesus. It's hard to talk about judgment, to think about where in our lives we fail him, where we miss the mark, how we mess up, the different ways that we hold on to pain or hurt, and so then we build coping mechanisms that cover that hurt and only cause more struggles and more hardship on our lives. It's hard to think about those things. And a couple of weeks ago, when I did the judgment sermon, um, we did an exercise. We looked at some different groups of people, some different labels, some different names. And I ask you to allow God to come into your heart and show you where you were struggling to love or where you may be judging. Well, today, we're going to do a little bit of a different exercise. 
I'm going to invite you to look at this screen. There's going to be a lot of different things on here. And I want you to ask God to show you your struggles. Where are you struggling? Where are you struggling to fully allow God to take over your life? So notice the tension in your body when you see something up on the screen. Be open to it. Ask God to reveal to you what you need to let him have the power over. So it's going to be quiet and awkward because that's how these things are supposed to be. We have to be able to fully hear God's voice. So no distractions, just a bunch of words. Let's look at these. This, of course, is not exhaustive. I'm sure there are things that maybe God helped you dig a little bit deeper on of some of these things that we struggle with. In CR, Celebrate Recovery, I know you've heard me talk about that ministry, and I'm going to talk about it a little bit more because it's my favorite. We call these hurts, habits, and hang-ups. And in CR, when we open with a testimony or a lesson or an open share, we open with this phrase. And if you would allow me, I am going to open how I typically open in CR and be vulnerable with you today. I am a grateful believer in Jesus Christ, and I struggle with an eating disorder, sugar addiction, and anger. And my name is Ashley. And that's never easy to say those things, especially in a space like this. <laughs> it's very difficult. But there's something about naming your struggles with people who love you, who are struggling as well. And we are all struggling. I've said that many times. We are all on an equal playing field. My struggles don't look like your struggles. Your struggles didn't look like mine. But we all have them. And there's something about when you say that, people responding back and saying, hey, Ashley, confirming that they care about me, that they care about my heart, and that they love me. Now, I know these struggles, these hurts, habits, and hang-ups don't define who I am. They don't make me, me. So why do I think it's important to name them? Why do I do that today? Why do I put myself out there today? I do it for the same reason that God gave Zephaniah this message of judgment and destruction followed by hope and salvation. When we name our struggles and allow God to have our power over them, we can fully experience his salvation right now. A lot of times when we think of salvation and this promise of salvation and what Jesus did for us on the cross, we think about something down the road. We think about heaven and what a beautiful, beautiful, eternal glory that will be. It's definitely something that we celebrate. But salvation is so much more than just the future. Salvation is having Jesus and the Holy Spirit present with us right now, experiencing freedom and love right now. You see, we take the time to acknowledge and work through our struggles so that we can experience God in our lives and all the great things of God. He replaces those struggles with his hope and peace and love, and the list goes on and on. Everything that God offers us, we have in our power through the Holy Spirit. The many attributes of God that he allows us to experience once we surrender to his will and allow him to overcome those struggles in our lives one day at a time. I think about the message that came to the people from Zephaniah. 
how this few righteous remnant heard these really terrible, hard destruction prophecies. How fearful they had to be when they heard those. I'm sure they questioned, God, we have been righteous and we have held faith to you. We have held on to your love and your truth and yet you're going to destroy this? But he doesn't leave them there. That message that we read in chapter three was not of a hope or something to come in the future. It was something that they had right now. Something that they could hold on to in the midst of that destruction was the love and the mercy of God that was with them in the midst of that. So what do we do with this dichotomy of a message of judgment and salvation? We share it. We share it. Actually, it's taken you two different sermons to talk about judgment and salvation, and you just want us to go out and share it? <laughs> it's kind of complex. But we do that through our testimony. You see, I shared with you my struggles, but I haven't shared with you how I've experienced Jesus in those struggles, so I want to share with you my life first. Oh, sorry. See what love, also, by the way, if you know this verse, you notice that this is the AIV. This is the Ashley International Version. See what love the Father has given me, that I am called a child of God, and that is what I am. The reason the world does not know me is that it does not know him. No matter how harsh I may see myself or judge myself or be critical of myself, this verse breathes into me the truth of God, that I am a child of God and that he loves me. And that if he loves me, I can love myself. And we all are children of God. And this second part of this verse, the reason that you don't, they don't know me is because they don't know him, that's a task. That's a challenge for us. I take it as a challenge every time I read it, that if they don't know me because they don't know him, I want them to know him through my story, my struggles, my story that is God's story. Now, Satan will tell me and you that God doesn't want to use your story. God doesn't want it. Trust me, there was a lot of things, a lot of doubt, a lot of lies in my head about sharing with you my struggles. Chris and I had a very long conversation about it because he, it impacts him too. He is my partner in this. He has bore these burdens with me. But the enemy doesn't want us to share our story. And the reason he doesn't want us to share our story is because he knows that God can move the most in our vulnerability and our honesty. Even though most of the time that honesty is ugly, raw, and harsh. At the end of the day, I cannot stand up here and be a messenger of God telling you to be vulnerable if I cannot be vulnerable myself with you. So that's where I landed on doing this. And I'll talk about it all day with any of you if you want to. Because friends, for a long time, I did not talk about it. I hid it, I pushed it, I ignored it, I avoided it. But friends, if you aren't naming and claiming your struggles and allowing God to have power over them, then they will have power over you. Jesus didn't die on the cross for that to happen. He died on the cross so that we would experience his freedom and his mercy and his grace. And not doing this is a big reason why people are so done with churches. That's why so often you hear people say, it's just a full of hypocrites. We don't look at ourselves enough in a way that God can come in and show us how we have been transformed. We're too busy pointing fingers at other people and what they're doing wrong. And we know the church is failing because Christianity is declining in this country. It's not our job to go out and tell people how they're sinning or how they're living wrong. It's our job to tell people how we are struggling, how we have failed, and how we have experienced Jesus' love in our own lives. That is how God can transform this world is through our stories. Now, if there is this lie going on in your head right now that I'm being way too personal, and I'm asking you to be way too personal, you go ahead and tell Satan to get on up out of here. This is personal. 
God is personal. If there is anything we learn from the Old Testament and how he is in the details of his people's lives throughout that whole book, it's that judgment is personal. Salvation is personal. He is in the details. He is intimate with us. Why do we think we get a pass on being intimate with him and being intimate with others? In Galatians 6, 1 through 5, it says, My friends, if anyone is detected in a transgression, you who have received the Spirit should restore such a one in a spirit of what, friends? Gentleness. Take care that you yourselves are not tempted. Read that underline with me. Bear one another burdens. And in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. For if those who, know no, who are nothing think they are something, they deceive themselves. All must test their own work. Then that work, rather than their neighbor's work, will become a cause for pride. For all must carry their own loads. We have to be personal. We cannot carry each other's burdens if we have not acknowledged our own burdens. If we haven't acknowledged them, talked about them, and allowed God to come in and help us get through them. Allow God to have power over them, not us. We cannot do this on our own. We have to have God's help. We cannot act as though we need Jesus and think it will work when we tell others they need Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, you are so holy and you are so good. We thank you for this time to hear your word, though it's hard. We thank you for your patience, that you are slow to anger with us, that while we miss the mark over and over and over again, you are there with us. You are there. As soon as our hearts turn back towards you, God, you have covered us in your forgiveness, assured us of your blood, and loved us deeply. God, we accept your grace. Help us to show it to others. Help us to articulate our testimony, our story, God, so that we can go out into this world and use it so that people can hear how you have transformed our lives so that we can transform this world to be one that brings you glory, one that brings your love to the surface, one that brings your grace in all that we do. God, we love you and thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to close with a really popular, classic hymn. So let's stand and sing some.